I matched into internal medicine. What does it take to get into the residency of your dreams when it seems like all the odds are stacked against you? My name is John Arshadi, and I want to welcome you to the Road to Residency podcast. This is the show where we break down inspiring personal journeys of passionate physicians who had the courage and the commitment to take purposeful action to achieve their goals and serve their communities. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Road to Residency podcast. I'm John Arshadi, and my guest today has a pretty interesting story. He's from Beru, Lebanon. He's a recent grad. He just matched in his first attempt. Dr. Antoine Bustani, welcome to the show, and congratulations for matching. Hey, John, thank you so much for introducing me. It's a pleasure to be here today. And it's great to have you. It's a pleasure to have you as a guest. So first, tell me about what was it like when you learned that you matched? What was that feeling that you got? Wow. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, it was a very special feeling, you know, uh, when you're in med school, you have a lot of big days like that after the MCAT, after getting in, uh, in the medical school. Mm-hmm. But this match was very different because uh, after everything that happened, the world, especially in Lebanon, yeah, it was a very, it's, it was a wonderful week, <laughs> not yeah. only day. Yeah, I bet. And so you matched at Cleveland Clinic, correct? In internal medicine? Exactly. So a Cleveland Clinic Fairview Hospital program. Uh-huh. Excellent. And was that your first choice? Yeah, definitely. It was my first choice. And so what made you choose that program? Well, um, ranking was very difficult because I've been interviewed at very uh, good and uh, interesting programs. So I took my time uh, in ranking my programs. Mm-hmm. But I finally chose Cleveland Clinic Fairview Hospital for many reasons. First of all, the program, uh, uh, the residents. The location, I have a lot of friends there. Um, I was impressed by the interviewers, by the quality of the program, uh, what it offers to its residents, how it treats its residents, um, the opportunities for any research experience and fellowships. So there, there are a lot of factors to consider when you rank your programs. Excellent. Are there any tips that you can give the listeners when they do rank their programs? What, what are some of the things that they should look at? Yeah, exactly. So um, before ranking, you should really know how the algorithm of the match works. Mm -hmm. So I highly recommend to watch videos on YouTube because it's very important that you do not rank based on where you have the more chance to match. You rank based on your preference because the applicant is always uh, prioritizing the process. So I highly recommend to really understand how the process works before starting to rank. That's my tip number one. Um, uh, Two, um, what I recommend also is to take notes after the interview. So basically, if you're interviewed in November or in December and you're going to rank your programs in February, you're going to, trust me, I've been through that, you're going to to miss uh, some details about the programs. So I highly recommend to like brainstorm everything after the interview and uh, and, uh, like uh, take notes of the advantages, the pros and cons of, of each program. Mm -hmm. Um, Some factors to consider, John, when ranking the programs, first of all, the type of hospital you want to work in. So is it a university, community, or affiliated program? Two, it's the state. So is it on the East Coast, on the West Coast, or Midwest? A third factor also, uh, it's uh, the research activities, the fellowship positions, in-house fellowship or not. Another very important fact also, it's the visa status. So will you be able to join on a H1 or on a J1? If you can do your J-1 waiver there, for example, uh, I'm going to train at uh, Ohio, uh, and in Ohio, I'll I'll be able to do my J-1 waiver there. So that's one of my plans. And how many programs did you apply to overall? Um, I applied to 163 programs. And so did you have any previous experience with these programs? Did you rotate over there, or did you do any research with them? Uh, Unfortunately, not because of uh, the COVID pandemic. My uh, electives in medical four and med four last year were interrupted. Mm -hmm. So um, I did uh, have the chance to to rotate uh, uh, in Washington in another program. Uh, My second elective got canceled. So unfortunately, not. Yeah, I remember you telling me that due to COVID, you know, everything got canceled. Yeah, exactly. Let's go back to before you applied for match. How did you prepare for the U.S. MLEs? Yeah, um, as I told you last time on our first interview, John, mm-hmm. uh, I'm lucky that my uh, medical school has an integrated program system. So yeah. basically, um, uh, you go over the systems, uh, system after system. You do, for example, 
two months of cardiology and then two months of uh, endocrinology, etc. Mm -hmm. Within the two months of cardiology, it's divided in weeks. So one week for arrhythmia only, one week for heart failure, for example, one week for EKGs. And within each week, all the courses, pharmacology, clinical science, clinical skills, everything will be related only to the theme of the week. For example, in heart failure, everything will be focused on heart failure. Uh, in this way, I was able to study my USMLEs in parallel with my MED1 and MED2 uh, uh, preclinical years. Mm -hmm. And that really helped a lot to be able to be done with my USMLEs uh, relatively on time. Uh, what I do recommend uh, for studying USMLEs is focus more on quality rather than quantity. So I really uh, encourage students to try to integrate the material of the USMLE with the material of their MED1 and MED2 classes. So uh, that I can, for example, add notes from their MED1 and MED2 classes to the USMLE book and, uh, uh, and vice versa. So that's uh, very efficient because you try to integrate all the information together and you, it will be very solid in your, in your mind. Yeah, I think that's one of the most efficient ways to do it. When we were talking last time, I just found the system of your medical school very fascinating. We said it's only your school, right? Yeah, so, well, it's one of the few. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's the only one in Lebanon, but, uh, but there are some other schools that, that are trying to start this, uh, this integration system, but uh, it's a very new type of... Uh, of uh, delivery, of uh, education delivery. Yeah. And so what were some of the uh, resources that you used outside of school? Well, that's a very good question. I'm going to start with my step one, how I studied for my step one. Mm -hmm. So basically what I did, as I told you before, uh, I studied step one in parallel. So one of my resources obviously was my uh, med school classes, the lectures of the, the, that I took during med one and med two. Right. So uh, I used to add some information from my lectures to the USM books. So, so that's one source. Another resource is Boards and Beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, honestly, Boards and Beyond, it's very time consuming, but it's very clear and very informative. So I do not recommend to do all the videos. What I recommend is to go over the book and whatever you do not understand, um, you can look the video, the, the appropriate video on Birds and Beyond. So that's a very efficient way to do it because otherwise it will be very time consuming. Right. Another, another very important tool to use for your SMLEs is Pathoma. Uh, it's either study, uh, either you can study Pathoma uh, from the book or from the videos. It's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I have more a visual memory. So I prefer, uh, I prefer to use the videos. But uh, what's important to note here is that for Pathoma, you need to do everything. It's not like Boards and Beyond. You just select what you did not understand from the book. You should go uh, over all the Pathoma material. Right. And <laughs> another tip also is to add the notes from Pathoma on your book. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the third source. And the fourth and most important one is UWord, of course. Yeah. I also recommend uh, taking your time with UWord. Also focus on quality more than quantity. Uh, this is why it's important to start early uh, so that you do not run out of time at the end of your medical uh, years. And uh, also you should take notes of, from your word and add them to the book. So that at the end of the day, you will have a very complete book with a lot of information from everywhere. You just read it and read it again, and it will be very solid in your mind. Excellent. And was it the same experience for step two or did you do something different? Yeah, so no, step, step two was quite different for me, mm -hmm. honestly, uh, because I have a lot of friends who, uh, who did their step two and did not recommend to go over the book. Why? Because uh, the book is well summarized, but not very well focused like the USMLE step one. Right. So there are a lot, of mo a lot more information. It's very hard to memorize everything. Uh, so what I did is to focus during my clinical years at the hospital as much as I can and do you were twice. So what I did is do you were twice. But let me tell you something very important, John. It's very important to do your step two after your step one directly. Do not delay the process because a lot of the step two material comes from step one. Yes. Uh, I would say around maybe... Maybe sixty percent of the step two will will uh, is very similar to the step one, so mm -hmm. this is why uh, you you can afford to skip the book only if you do your step two just after your step one. Right, and that's something I always recommend people to you know don't put any gaps in between your studying because you know if you take off two or three weeks you come back to it it's like you're starting all over again. Exactly. 
And also one of the things I advise for students, I don't know, you don't have this uh, experience because you did them in order, but a lot of students who have already graduated and now they're taking their steps afterwards, they want to start with step two first because it's more clinical um, and they feel like it's easier. That might be true, but like you said, a lot of step one is on step mm-hmm. two. So I recommend, mm-hmm. you know, going back to the basics, do well on step one. You're going to do amazing on step two as well. Yeah, that's a very good point, John. I was going to, to add it to the to my comments. Yeah. Um, what, what What's also very important to note is that uh, starting January 2022, the step one will be pass or fail. That yeah. means you will have more importance for the uh, step two CK uh, grade. This is why you should like really do very well on your step two CK. Yeah. So this is why it's better to do your step one first, especially if you're applying to the match 2022 and, uh, and above. Absolutely. And so mm-hmm. I'm getting a lot of mixed comments about, you know, about how this will affect IMGs. What's your take? Do you think it's going to be better or worse? What do you think? Um, it's a personal opinion. There's n- nothing solid to my uh to what I'm going to say now, but it's a personal opinion. Honestly, I'm go- I think that it will be very, uh, it will be more difficult than regular years for many reasons. The first one, uh, the interview will stay online. That means that more US grads will continue to take uh, all their interviews like they did uh, this match. And this is why we, uh, in general, got less interviews than pre- previous three years. Right. Another, another uh, very important point is that so the step one will be pass or fail uh, i don't know if it's going to be uh, this rule be applied for the match 2022 i don't think so but for the match 2023 and so on it will it will become pass or fail so that means you only have the step two ck to to assess you for an interview so that makes the process more competitive another reason is that you have now a six pathway so th- th- that means you will have more imgs applying to the match Right. That also makes the process more competitive. Another thing also, uh, we all know that uh, that there, there are a lot of IMGs who were not able to apply to this match this year. So they are all going to apply for next year's match. That's all, That also adds uh, some competition for next year. So I think the process overall will be a little bit more competitive. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's not the end of the world. You should not look at it in a very negative way. You should just try to uh, acknowledge it and to uh, and to respond uh, to this uh, challenge in a different way right and for those listeners that you know maybe aren't aware of the situation what is the six pathway that opened up can you explain that for us yeah so the six pathway um, uh, it's basically uh, going in the process of uh, like a mini cx so i don't know if the listeners here are familiar with the mini CX, mini CX is when a certified physician assesses your clinical skills in the hospital. For example, uh, when you're examining a patient and something like that. But for more de- more details about this pathway are coming in the ne- uh, are coming soon in the the, ne- the coming month. Yeah. So I cannot say more about it. But uh, I'm just giving an idea about what it's going to be. Absolutely. And, you know, if, if you're interested in more information, you could always go to the uh, ECFMG or the USMLE website. And they always have exactly. in their announcements and news. They have, you know, all these details. Let's talk a little bit about, so we talked about step one and step two. Now, this was an interesting story you told me too about your OET. Let's talk a little bit about the OET. What was taking that exam like and how did you prepare for it? Okay, so the OET was a very challenging process, not because of the exam itself, but because of my context uh, living in Lebanon. What happened on August 4, 2020, uh, the Beirut blast happened. It destroyed uh, half of the capital of the Beirut capital. So uh, I'm sorry to hear that, man. Thanks, John. So it was very devastating for all Lebanese citizens. And unfortunately, I had to sit for my OET exam a few weeks after the blast, I think two weeks after the blast. So I was still psychologically shocked and under stress. So uh, that was the most challenging part. But I'm not going to focus on that here uh, for the purpose of uh, of this, this interview. But I'm going to inform the listeners is how to uh, study for your OET and how to pass your OET on the first attempt because myself I did not pass on the first attempt. I'm going to tell you why. So basically if you want to study for the OET um, if you have nothing to do and you have an empty schedule you can do it in one week. Um, I recommend like around six to six hours of OET every day for five days 
uh, it's a little bit risky. So for those who are not very uh, good in English or have a pretty busy schedule, I do recommend extending your study time to around two weeks. So uh, I'm giving you an idea about how long you should study for the OET exam. Mm -hmm. Two, uh, how to study for the exam. So you have um, some resources. You have the OET website, which provides you with, I, I, if I remember well, four sample tests uh, that are free. Mm -hmm. So you can do a sample test every day. And I recommend to do it very seriously because it's a practice exam. Another resource that you can use, it's a, it, it's a website called Swoosh English, mm -hmm. S-W-O-O-S-H English. I used this source uh, for my second attempt of OET mm -hmm. uh, because uh, there was no place for a second mistake. Yeah. So these are the two resources. Uh, one secret that I can give is practice as much as you can. This is why it's very important to do all the uh, sample exams. Mm -hmm. uh, and another very, very, very important tip, OET exam is not about how good you are in English. Right. I was in an American institution. I'm good in English. I have other friends who are also good in English. It's not enough. Mm -hmm. To pass your OET, you need to give them what they want. Right. In writing, right. listening, uh, uh, listening, reading, and speaking. So basically, you go to the website, you see exactly how they grade each section, and you give them what they want during your exam. Yeah. All right. So after you completed all these exams, you got your UCFMG certification. What was the application process like? Um, well, what, what I recommend is start very early for the personal statement and the CV and the ERAS application. Mm -hmm. So you should start around maybe june to july so you, you will buy your token around june right i do recommend taking the month of july to do a very thorough search for your hospitals that you're going to apply for mm -hmm. you have two websites that you can use that are highly effective it's uh, one of them is called frida and the other one is called residency explorer uh, what you can do is use these websites and do make a list um, uh, the list will be divided in many states, the U.S. states, and in each state you will uh, you will list the hospitals that are present in this state. And for every hospital, you can include criteria. The first one could be the type of hospital. The second one could be the percent IMG uh, in the program. The third one could be visa requirements. So, so maybe they, they do not sponsor any visa. The third one would be the USMLD score requirements to enter the program. And uh, uh, you have also some special requir requirements uh, in some programs, for example, six months of US clinical, clinical experience. Um, another special requirement could be letters of, letter of recommendation from the chair of the department. And uh, another criteria that you can use also to, to choose your hospital, the hospital you're going to apply to is to, um, uh, according to the location of the hospital and the people you know there, because of course they 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 will be uh, they will be uh, of some help in the program during the interview process. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is how you search for your hospitals. All right. So yeah, uh, July is um, you know a good time, but I would even venture to say start earlier if you can. If you could start even at the beginning of the year, the more time you have to research these programs, the better. Um, but after that, you know, after July, what would what's the next step? Yeah, so basically this year we had um, the deadline to uh, to apply for the ERAS. It's not the deadline to apply, it's the date when the programs will start reviewing the application to be more precise. It was on uh, on, tw on the 21st of October, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Right. So you have from July until October to do all the rest. Mm -hmm. You have the personal statement, you have the CV, and I do recommend applicants to really take their time in writing the CV and writing their personal statement, because if you have mistakes in those two documents, the programs will know because they go through them, they read them, and they will know how much time you invested in your application. So the more you invested time, you mo the more you, you serious you are as an applicant. 
And if you're listening right now, even though this year they submitted applications in October, I don't think that they're going to do the same thing next year. I think from starting from next year, it's going to be September 15th again, like it always was. So mm-hmm. be prepared for September 15th. If you have extra time, then that's great. It's just more time that you have. Uh, but make sure you stay mm-hmm. prepared for that. I would say start working on your personal statement and your CV now because you're going to revise this over and over again. You're going to come back mm-hmm. to it. And you're going to be like, oh, what was I thinking writing this, right? And so it's an ongoing process. It's not something you want to do in a couple of days or even a couple of weeks. That's a very good point to, to add, John. Yeah. Uh, in my case, for example, I have 12 drafts. Wow. Yeah. So I took really my time in writing it. I took a lot, around three months. But of course, it was like, uh, it's not, it was not a full-time uh, process, but it was uh, all about revising it and revising it. True. True. Mm -hmm. And so letters of recommendation, I know you're in Beirut right now and you weren't able to do your U.S. clerkship. So which letters did you use? So uh, the first one that I used is the one from the physician with whom I was was rotating in Washington, Uh D.C. So she's a board certified gastroenterologist. Okay. Uh, So she wrote for me, she was kind enough and and wrote for me uh, a letter of recommendation, even though my orient- my uh, observership was interrupted. Right. The second letter of recommendation, I've got it from the attending with whom I'm working on research. He's also a Canadian board certified. So these are two letters that I got from abroad. Mm-hmm. Um, for the rest of my letters of recommendation, unfortunately, my second elective got cancelled. So what I did is reach out to board certified attendings Uh, with whom I rotated during my clinical years in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Uh, So what I recommend applicants to do is, first of all, try to get letters of recommendation from people abroad. So either US, Canada, maybe Europe. Of course, US is the best option. If it's not possible because uh, electives are still not uh, accessible right now, what they can do is reach out to board certified more specifically, American board certified attendings at their own institutions, uh, abroad, of course, so not in the U.S. And if also, if it's not possible, the third option would be to reach out to uh, attendings and physicians in their own institutions who are not board certified, but who have high uh, academic positions, like, for example, a chair or, 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 or a program director, Okay, great. Thanks for that. And um, let's talk about your interviews. How was the interview process for you? Well, honestly, my experience was very good. Um, I had a really great experience with all the hospitals where I, I, I've been interviewed. Uh, and I was surprised because I thought that it was the first year that, I are, that, that they are doing that. And uh, of course, they're going to do mistakes and things like that. But honestly, uh, it was very professional, very well organized. And my friends also had the same uh, experience as mine. Right. Um, I do recommend also taking a lot of time and preparing for your interviews uh, Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, really try to use a lot of resources. The first one you can use is YouTube. You have a lot of resources on YouTube. So just type in um, residency match, interview preparations. Uh, A second resource is the AAMC guides and seminars that they uh, organize during the season. It's very useful to watch them and to read the the guides that they send you. Mm -hmm. A third one, uh, you have a couple of books online. So it depends on each applicant uh, if he prefers to watch videos or or read books for the interviews. Uh, One of the most important resources that you can use uh, is your friends. So basically I... Yeah, so I practice with one of my friends who's not in the medical field. He's a consultant, but uh, really he's he has a lot of experience in interviews, and um, I was able to really uh, work well on my interviews and prepare them very well with him. So I also recommend practicing a lot, a lot, a lot with your with people you know who have experience in interviews. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And one thing that I would add, you know, like you said, because it was the first time they they're having virtual interviews. Um, make sure you uh, have some technology backup as well, because as we stated in a previous interview, you know, things can go wrong with technology and you want to have um, options. 
So uh, that's a very, very, very important point. Always be ready if, and have backups in case the internet uh, connection is unstable. But I want to reassure uh, the listeners here that I have some friends who had trouble with connection, especially from Lebanon, because here uh-huh. the electricity and the internet uh, is not very, uh, it's not, is not great. Right. So uh, just to reassure the listeners that programs are usually very nice. So they will understand. They will either reschedule an, another interview or wait for you to come back. So don't be stressed about it, but always be ready because you can never know. Uh, but uh, also don't think that, don't um, don't think it's the end of the world in case your internet is unstable. Right. And so do you have any last minute tips or suggestions of, you know, what how, what can people do to really stand out amongst the crowd and, you know, secure mm-hmm. the residency spot? Yeah, uh, one of my biggest advice is to be proactive. So uh, the U.S. match 2021 was very challenging and the match 2022 will definitely be also very uh, tough. So what I do recommend is for the applicant to be proactive, never, uh, never let challenges and, uh, and any obstacle eat you and uh, come over you. So always be proactive and try to control your interview process and your application process. This is my number one tip. My number two tip is to uh, always be safe. So uh, if the season is challenging, if the season is uh, very tough, play it safe. Go to the safe side. Apply to a lot of programs. Prepare for everything. Be uh, great on everything at all the levels. Interviews, CV, personal statement, letters of recommendation. So always play it safe if you're in an environment that's not uh, my tip number three, and we've talked about it, start early. The earliest you start, the earliest you'll be ECFMG certified, the earliest you will have, uh, the earliest you will be uh, ready for your interviews, the more you will have interviews and the more uh, you will know how to rank your programs if you start early on. And uh, uh, the last tip, the most important one, invest time and energy in every step of your application. Do not miss anything and do not and take every, every step of your application seriously uh, and uh, of equal importance. Absolutely. So Dr. Anton Bustami, everybody, um, I appreciate you being on the show. I appreciate all your advice. If any of you have any questions for either one of us, the, our contact information will be down below in the show notes. You can reach out to any of us for help, any questions you have. Dr. Bustami, again, thank you very much. It's great to have you on the show and I hope to see everybody um, next week. John, thank you so much. The pleasure is mine. I wish a very good luck to everyone out there. And uh, I really appreciate your nice initiative to organize this and to help applicants as much as uh, we can. So thank you for that. Thank you. If you haven't already, please rate and review the podcast, share it with your friends and get this message out there. Because this is a time where a lot of people are skeptical and they're saying, I'm an older grad, I'm an IMG, I have trouble with the USMLEs, there's no way I can compete, what do I do? Well, we want to show you that there is hope. Actually, right now is the best time to match as an IMG. You know, our match rates have gone up from 48% in 2010 when I graduated medical school to 61% in the 2020 match. That's a significant jump. And as a matter of fact, more than 25% of the U.S. healthcare system is made up of international grads. So know that you can do it. You will do it. Just don't give up. And I hope to see you in the next episode.